what is new in the sperm so if you look at the sperm these are the some of the things that are new now sperm selection selecting a better sperm so you can get a better embryo obviously if you select a better genetically better sperm you will get a genetically better embryo so we have a lot of new techniques that are available uh, to us and the three important techniques are the double density gradient the microfluidics which has come out in a big way so it has got channels so it automatically you don't have a centrifugation you just have to load the cartridge and there are channels through which the sperms are selected so because the centrifugation force damages the sperm so you can select a sperm without centrifugation the problem in any new advances by in biotechnology is costs so you remember you can't get care or quality without spending money whenever someone tells me rishikesh i will give you money back you take i give me 100000 and i'll give you interest of 25% i'll never do it if someone gives me saying that you give me interest of 5% i'll give the money to him because i know that you have to be realistic in it you need to spend lot of money in biotechnology otherwise you cannot get performance so this microfluidics is a 6000 rupees cartridge but i use it for my ius also nowadays because it's so good the harvesting is so good of the sperm that it gives better performance even in iuis then in there's something of surgical sperm retrieval so in patients of obstructive azoospermia it's very easy you put a needle in and you take the sperm out but in non obstructive azoospermia you can do micro tisa and fortunately my colleague dr rupin shah works with me for many last so many 20 years is i always tell my patient he is the number one doctor in the world forget india number one andrologist of the world bc roy body superb technique in patients who come to me who have not got sperms outside on tisa rupin gives me 50% recovery in micro tisa so he is a fabulous so it's a very meticulous when rupin shah is doing micro tisa all our embryologists are very dukhi because it is just two hours of micro tisa they say sir abhi usko bolo band karne ko abhi small small pieces he will send one one tubule mila ke sperm mila ke sperm you will be surprised that when i went to texas dolores lam is the queen of micro tisa and you, they spend 8 hours looking at the sperm they charge 40000 dollars because they say that this is the last time the patient is going to have a chance of getting a sperm we to finish it in half an hour one hour the american groups look at the testicular sperm for 8 hours in teams of two because that's where you get that sperm so more time you spend more dedicated you are you have to see thousands of fields and pick up that sperm so micro tisa is a fabulous technique for non obstructive azoospermia and then another new breakthrough came in it was a very casual about 4 5 4 years back some also i got a phone call are koi israel guy has come he is demonstrating nigudkar had phoned me and he is demonstrating how to freeze single sperm then i told my gang all the embryologists ke liye chalo jaate hain dekhne ko and this couple had come from israel and they demonstrated how you can freeze single sperm i was really excited you know i immediately next day i called him and said ye khareed lo utha lo isko and start practicing and now we you know many of these patients of non obstructive azoospermia if you take repeated samples you in one sample out of 40 you will get two three sperms and you can pick up those sperms and freeze them with this device so we accumulate the sperms now and you will be surprised many times you don't get sperms on the biopsy but you will get sperms on this repeated ejaculation so it's a called cryptospermia and the other thing is that when you are selecting the sperm so you magnify so normally you carry out ixi at a magnification of 200 times instead of that you can do ixi at 6600 times so this is a ixi which you magnify the image 6600 time you can it's called imc intracytoplasmic morphologically selected sperm Now obviously if you magnify the image and you can actually measure the sperm length the sperm bread you can see how many vacuoles are there in the sperm head what is the diameter of the vacuole obviously you can pick out i didn't want to show there's another 
video i want to show now there is a new artificial intelligence software which is linked by internet to a server in mexico my friend is doing this study so the as they are as we are looking at the sperms the server picks up the mot motility and the form of the sperm and the artificial intelligence tells you which sperm to pick up and do injection so ai is going to slowly replace the selection of sperms the other thing which is which we brought in which was a fantastic breakthrough i feel was spindle check so you can actually see the spindle you can see that white dot at 10 o'clock at 12 o'clock position that is the actual chromosomal spindle so you know normally after you retrieve the oocytes the spindle forms in about 2 to 3 hours after retrieval so it is around 39 hours after the hcg injection and if you do ecsi after spindle is formed or if you freeze the oocytes after the spindle is formed or when you thaw the oocytes you wait for the spindle to reform it takes about 2 3 hours so we have a lot of these patients who come for freezing for the long term and they now has started coming for thawing so we are we have got only eight oocytes that's it so i have to what so when i have these patients i what i do is first i take out a pack i'll try it out and see whether this pack the chemicals are performing well because these are only eight oocytes of that patient who she had frozen eight years back so i have to be dog sure that that chemical pack is damn good if there is a problem and the custom i have lost those eggs and so once we thaw those eggs we look at the spindle so spindle reforms in 2 to 3 hours after the spindle reforms if we do injection we get fantastic embryos so spindle check is used a lot by us for egg freezing you can also use germline cell now stem cells can be used for patient of non obstructive azoosperm you can use the stem cells and convert them into sperm and the first work of this has been done in uh, valencia stanford and in china and mice pups have been now born by converting stem cells into sperm and using them and creating the children and that human work has started now and within 5 years time you will be able to get the sperm manufactured through stem cells what about the ovary what's new in the ovary so we have one is of course the oocyte and ovarian tissue freezing that has come for fertility preservation which is now more or less standardized we have the ovarian tissue activation the ovarian rejuvenation and the artificial ovary so in fertility preservation we all know we can freeze the oocyte now and uh, it, which is established but even the ovarian tissue can be frozen and this as can be used for multiple reasons donor oocyte program pre cancer treatment program you can use it for you know postponement of fertility in patients of endometrioma so it's called endo fertility so we have got three types of fertility onco fertility so you freeze the oocytes prior to patient having cancer of the breast which is common list so the three common cancers for which oocytes are used nowadays is breast cancer hodgkins lymphoma and non hodgkins lymphoma so in these cancers you can and there is something called random stimulation so if patient comes to you today and says sir i have got breast cancer hai in 4 din mein treatment do hafte mein chalu karna hai to you can immediately stimulate her you don't have to wait for her second day of period because what we have found that any time stimulation you will get the same number of oocyte but if she says sir do hi din hai mere paas so you can go with the laparoscope take out the ovary and freeze the ovarian cortex and so these are the two techniques which we can do what about the poor ovarian reserve so in poor ovarian reserve which is a lot see i get lot of these poor ovarian you know normal ovarian reserve young patient doesn't come only to me because they all are done by the now the so many junior clinics are there when i started i was we were seven now we are three and a half thousand so obviously what we get is the difficult patient it's like the cardiac surgeon he gets the redo surgery bypass done after 12 years you comes for a redo so same way in our unit we get failure five failures six failures eight failures highest ivf failure we have done me and nandita is 22 failures from london so we get failure patient so we have to give them something better so if when a lot of poor ovarian reserve patient first thing i think of is tuberculosis and the only way to diagnose ovarian or peritoneal tuberculosis is to put a scope inside you must put the scope in otherwise you can't diagnose tb pcr and all false positivity is too high 
जेनेटिक्स इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू रूल आउट टर्नर मोजेक्स एंड टू रूल आउट फ्रेजाइल एक्स सिंड्रोम मेनी फ्रेजाइल एक्स सिंड्रोम पेशेंट्स मैनिफेस्ट एज पुअर ओवर एन रिजर्व सो फ्रेजाइल एक्स हाउ विल यू टेस्ट फॉर फ्रेजाइल एक्स कैन यू टेल मी हाउ यू विल टेस्ट फॉर फ्रेजाइल एक्स एनी वन सो दिस इज डन बाय पी सी आर टेस्ट सो पी सी आर एनालिसिस इज डन दज अ किट एंड यू लुक एट द रिपीट्स and based on that you can diagnose a fragile x because what is the danger of fragile x if a low ovarian patient is actually a fragile x syndrome you can have a mentally retarded child so you must rule out i always test the patients of low mh for fragile x then of course there are various things which you can do you can use testosterone gel you can give them dhas etc etc and you can also do rejuvenation so one of the techniques that is used is by dr kuwamara actually i went to los angeles to learn this technique many years back which is called ovarian tissue activation you take the ovary out by laparoscope and you mince it you freeze it after 6 months you thaw the ovarian tissue you expose it to what is known as p10 inhibitor and p13k enhancer which are and then you put those ovarian tissue back so it activates the, so there is something called a hippo access so in ovary so what later on what they have realized that and this is for you young people here so the what they realized that the activation of the ovary is not because of the p10 inhibitor exposure it is because of the cutting of the ovary because when you cut the ovary there is a hippo axis that get disturbed and the ovary gets reactivated so nowadays the same group what they are doing is they go in with a the laparoscope they just take out they cut the ovary take out the piece and cut them into pieces and put them back on the same setting because it's not so much the freezing and the exposure it is the cutting of the ovary which enhances and activates the ovary just like if you have a pcod it is the drilling of the ovary which activates the the ovary the other thing you can do is inject them with prp or bone marrow which again i do a lot of prp injection nowadays but i'm quite skeptical but the the trick in that is that you must give gcsf to the patient two days in advance because the gcsf subcutaneous will stimulate the bone marrow to throw out stem cells into the circulation so what the, when you are doing prp actually when you inject it into the ovary you are creating trauma that trauma is bringing the stem cells so if there are already huge amount of stem cells in the circulation they will go towards the site of the injury so if you give gcsf and stimulate them and then do the prp two days later not only you'll get a better prp because you will have a huge amount of stem cells in the concentrate but they will also go to the site and deposit so this is a very important trick which we use for prp the other thing is stem cell injection now this is one th area where i am a bit apprehensive because i am worried that that stem cell may mutate and ca cause cancer i don't know the stem cell can in prp it's a indirect attraction of the stem cell you put the prp and the prp attracts the stem cells to the site here you are putting stem cell directly into the site whether they will mutate you know lot of in the other parallel science like for example in neuro you put the stem cell in the brain and it becomes a bone it has a it has a it can become any tissue normally it will become a brain tissue but it may not become a brain tissue so mutation and causing malignancy is a two fears of stem cell treatment so it's not easy you can just put it but there are long term implications which you have to think about before you put it the other very exciting area is mitochondrial disease just now i've got a phone call two days back from one american guy saying rishikesh would you like to start the work i said sure we'll just like apply to the dgci and start the work so cytoplasmic transfer so mitochondrial disease is a big problem one in 4000 is the incidence of mitochondrial disease and with the advancement of four things micro manipulator spindle check which i showed you chemical and electrofusion technology and genetic testing we have been able to switch the nucleus of the cell so this is known as mito spindle transfer so what does spindle transfer do so we have this donor oocyte which is in green on top so you take the oocyte and you can see the spindle i showed you the spindle check technology 
So you put it on the spindle check and you enucleate the spindle. You see, open it the zona with a laser, enucleate the spindle. After that, so you have a oocyte which is enucleated now. Now you take the actual mother's oocyte, which is she is 39 year old, five IVF failures, but doesn't want to use donor oocytes. So you get these oocytes. We normally they freeze them in the previous cycle. So after we get the fresh oocyte, donor oocyte, and you enucleate it, you thaw the mother's oocyte which you have frozen before. And you take the spindle from the mother's oocyte and you put it into the donor oocyte and fuse it. You will ask me how you fuse it. There are two techniques. One is electrofusion. But the better technique is to expose them to a virus. <laughs> so you may get scared. <laughs> what is this COVID virus? It's called the Sendai virus. So Sendai virus is an immunohematological virus which has got a property of fusion. So when a cell is exposed to Sendai virus, it activates and the spindle fuses with the oocyte and a new oocyte is formed with the donor cytoplasm of a young donor but the DNA is of the mother and then you do. So Nuno Costa Borges has already had 14 births in Spain. Every four months I phone him, Nuno, when are you having the first workshop? I want to come for it. He says, no, wait, because we are, our clinical trials are going on. We are finding out whether the children are having imprinting. So the biggest problem with spindle transfer technology are two complications. One is the imprinting disorders can occur. And second is heteroplasmy. There's a mixture of the mitochondria can occur. So these are two problems, but ye to main karunga hai. Means I am set to do it. So, but instead of doing spindle transfer, you can do what is known as pronuclear transfer. The advantage of pronuclear transfer is that you don't need the machine, spindle check machine to see the spindle. So, in pronuclear transfer, you fertilize the donor oocyte with the donor sperm, fertilize the, you know, the actual patient's oocyte with the husband's sperm. After one day, 24 hours later, pronuclear form, then you enucleate the pronuclear and you transfer this. This technology is done. And already one baby is, uh, no, multiple babies have been born and I was actually going to go and train in this technology. You know where it was the master was sitting in Ukraine. <laughs> and you know, first time when I was going, the COVID happened and the second time, I don't know, I hope he's alive. So what's new in the embryo? The embryo, they have got advanced culture and manipulation techniques, embryo selection techniques. And embryo editing, you can edit the embryo also. So, of course, you can do a day two uh, transfer, which is a four cell transfer, or a day three transfer, which is a eight cell transfer, or a day five transfer, uh, which is a 150 cell transfer, which is called a blastosis. And blastosis are very good, but you need to have a very good lab. There are a lot of labs where the blastosis utilization rate, it is called BUR. The BUR is just 30%. So if you have three day three embryos, only one will form a blastosis. While there are a lot of labs, superb labs in the United States. Top at up. 50%. Every time two embryos they put, one will become a blastosis. So you need to have a high level lab. You can't just say, Acha, main art embryo dala, do blastosis ho gaya. You must have art embryo dala, char blastosis ban gaya. So this is very important and that is dependent, I feel, on human. The PhD is the, the dedication, I tell you. I keep on telling my embryologists. In United States, every incubator is tested thrice a day. Morning, afternoon, and evening. Logbook is maintained. PH is done. Temperature check is done. Who will do in India? Mein? So this is the problem. So then if you look at the... Blastosis, obviously this, it was a Glujowski's meta-analysis of 2016, wherein he showed that the blastosis obviously gives better pregnancy rate than day three transfer. So it is accepted, now, provided you have a fantastic lab. If you don't have a, a good lab, just put those three day three transfers, embryos on day three and you will get a very good pregnancy. When you keep it for two more days outside the body, then a lot of factors of the lab are also acting on the embryo. It's not just the endogenous factors of the blastosis. There are exogenous lab factors. So you must have a very good lab. 
to have a blastocyst culture system going on. Hatching technology is there since 1998. You cut the zona and in patients with re two repeated IV fillers, yes, there's a lot of meta-analysis that has shown hatching works and you need the laser because nowadays we do a lot of PGD and embryo transfer. I always say it's the holy grail, but actually now when I started doing transfer and I really peaked in my transfer, I was the best in the country. I really peaked in my transfer, but then what happened is I structured the transfer. Now all my assistants have the same pregnancy rate. But the other day when I was talking, they said, Sir, we say something in your hands. And I tell you, what is it? That is called tapasya. That is what Vishwamitra got when he was in penance for 12 years. This is the sixth sense. This is what we in modern language call machine learning and artificial intelligence. It is the, the computers in your brain. For example, many of you must be doing caesarean in 12 minutes. God, God knows how you do it. I will never be able to do it also. Or some of you must be doing hysterectomy in 10 minutes. That comes with time. That un the juniors have to understand that. Only time and I call it again and again and again. You do it repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Neen maybe I can put it Embryo. I'll get the pregnancy which others don't get. But that comes with the tapasya. You know, that is very important. But nowadays, my juniors say, Are, Sir, we also have the same result. Because we, we, dis we disconnected it. We made it into steps which could be replicable. That's, that's very important. For evolution of technology, you need to be able to make it in such a fashion that even your juniors can do it as good as you can or better than you. What about freezing? So, I remember that in 2007, 2006, I was very uncomfortable. I was bored and I was surfing the net and I saw one Japanese group, Masa Kowayama. I wrote to him and in broken English, he wrote back and told me, you come. No, I, me and Rishma went to Tokyo, to the biggest clinic in the world. It is called Kato Women's Clinic. Every day they do 50 cycles. And Kato was a multi billionaire. He had four units in. You will ask me, what? How come in Tokyo, Japan, so many IVF centers? Because most Japanese women get married at 45. They get married at 45. Before that, they don't get married. So as soon as they get married, they go for IVF. So I went there and in one day, I went in the morning, me and Rishma, at 9 o'clock, he said, some is, I, Tera, Tera Moto, his assistant was there. He said, come, come, come. He showed me hey, the chart. He said, I, in three hours in broken Jap English, he told me, in three hours, we are doing 50 pickup. I will have 50 pickup. Eki table tha udar. In three hours, they did 50 pickups. There were nine nurses. Every three minutes, they were putting patient on the table and tak 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 one was putting the legs second was a cleaning third was draping and tiramoto used to go tak 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 because they were doing mild stimulation five six suicides the the needle was 21 gauge needle normally we use a 17 gauge needle so it's painful this is a 21 gauge teflon coated needle they don't use anesthesia at all not even local tak 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 out and by 12 o'clock, he did 50 pickups. Me and Rishma were tired. Then he said, let's go for lunch. And after lunch, he said, now come, I'll teach. And he taught me diagram vitrification. I came back and first vitrification in the country I did. First I did, second I did, third I did. The embryos were recovering 90%. I said, yeah, this is jadu. Hai. And that's how I got my break because that was the because I was the monopoly that time. Of course, then all of these guys learned it. But for five years, I had the monopoly of vitrification. I sent him a Cartier watch after two years. I said, thank you. Masa, I call him little master. I said, you gave me a fantastic technology. So should we freeze also? There is a lot of people who think that Are yaar, freezing karke next cycle mein dalte hai na. Results are better because you have the lining, you prepare it artificially and then you put the 
embryos in. But there is a lot of studies now that have come from United States that in poor responders or normal responders, whether you freeze or you put in the same cycle, it gives the same result. But only in hyper responders, you can freeze and transfer them in the next cycle and you get better results. The other technology that has come on on a very rapid way is embryo selection. Because what happened in the world is what they realized that by putting two and three embryos back, a lot of multiple pregnancies started occurring and preterm births and complications of preterm birth started occurring. So, can we select the best embryo and maintain the same pregnancy rate? So, most of the American groups and most of the British groups, Britain mein to law hi hai, you cannot put more than one embryo. So, it is, they have a campaign. It is called one at a time campaign. You have to put one at a time. You can't put more than one and the one at a time campaign the multiple pregnancy rate has gone down to six percent in united states it has gone down to three percent so because in uh, in the catholic countries they don't do embryo reduction so multiple pregnancy so they'll amara india may needle dal ke reduce kar the ethical they have a lot of ethical issues of embryo reduction so they're one at a time so you need to have a technology if there are four blastocysts which is the one which i can select and still give the best result and so there are a lot of technologies that are there you can do morphological standard morphological classification or blastocyst selection itself is a selection technology so if you select a blastocyst it's in itself or the the commonest use technology is pgt pre-implantation genetic testing and you could take a so normally you could do a day three biopsy called blastomere but you could damage the embryo but now you can do a day 5 biopsy because in the day 5 blastocyst, there are two parts of the blastocyst. There's an inner cell mass from which the baby is born and there's an outer cover from which the placenta is formed. So you take the trophectodum biopsy and this is how you do it. You take a biopsy of the... You, you can take the biopsy or you can... Now we, what we do is we... The DNA leaks out in the fluid, so we can actually cut, take the DNA and amplify the DNA without doing a biopsy. It's called non-invasive PGTA. So once you take the biopsy, you then freeze it because you can see you can open the kit. It's very costly, so you have to wait for 20 to 30 embryos. So you have to freeze this DNA in minus 20 freezer. And in China, where I was trained in PGTA, China is a, another story. It's too fantastic, but in China, where I was trained in PGTA, they have to compulsorily store all DNA, even uh, amniocentesis, amniotic fluid, for three years in, at minus 80 for medical legal purpose. So, if there's a challenge by a patient, they can take out the DNA and retest it. So, in so we in our lab also we have got two freezers: a minus 20 freezer and I have got a deep freezer, a minus 80 freezer also, where I do. So, this is a minus 20 degrees freezer where you keep so you keep on accumulating the dna till enough embryos are accumulated and then you start doing the procedure so once the enough embryos are accumulated or enough dna of different embryos is accumulated then you run the so there are two methods one is what called a cgh microarray which is now purana method new method is ngs next gen sequencing so ngs was actually invented by nick macko in 2000 but it was applied by Treff, Nathaniel Treff in 2013 in, in IVF. So there was a quite a window. So you once there are enough DNAs you what do you know this is called vortexing. The DNA settled down at the bottom. You need to vortex the DNA. Once the DNA is vortexed we do a PCR. We do an amplification and what we do is also we tag the embryo. So what we do, all these 30 embryos are going to be put in one tube. How do you know whose embryo is it? So before you put it in one tube, you tag it. It's called barcode tagging. So every, there's a barcode, so you tag the embryo. And you once you tag it, then you amplify the PCR and you mix them into one tube. That's called template formation. So this is how we would donate the template. Now, all these DNA of multiple embryos are automatically mixed by the machine in three and a half hours time and and they are then concentrated on a cartridge so they mix everything they put everything 
we have to do manually now we do it automatic and then once that is done in three and a half hours time you take the cartridge out and that cartridge you put in the sequencer and the machine sequences so it takes about five and a half hours hi lakshmi welcome it takes so this is the cartridge once the cartridge is formed you put it in the sequencer see this is the cartridge is formed now all the dna of all the embryos are on that one cartridge now this is the sequencer you slot it in the sequencer and five hours it runs in the night tak 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 it will sequence all the dna of the all the 35 you can do 92 embryos at one time in the sequencer and so more embryos you do better the cost effectiveness for you and then you can then it is uploaded on the internet and the the geneticists can be having tea or coffee or whatever in his house and they see each of the sequences and they take normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal and they tag the embryo accordingly. So, so this, when again I was very unhappy with myself, I was getting bored. So in 2016, I saw this paper by Zhu et al, where he had, without touching the embryo, by using the DNA which has leaked in the uh, culture media, and he had amplified it and he had sequenced it. I was really excited. I wrote to him and in 2019, just before the COVID, I went to Shanghai. Pachas Hajar embryos they do every month in Shanghai. You know, huge seven, eight sequences. Ek din mein seek liya sab. Vapis aake maine utko put up kar diya. And these are the prelims. And now we have done thousands, hundreds of, we have already done publication. We are doing a one large publication also. And then this is the embryoscope. So this is another way. So instead of look, doing looking at the genetics, you look at the video. So this is the embryoscope where you can actually load the embryos and you can take the photographs. It's called time lapse photography. So you can take the time lapse photography of the embryos. And there is a new study by Tran et al. So what he did was he took the videos and 115,000 videos were put in a machine learning. You know. I just want to tell you this funny story. In order to do this, they bought an artificial intelligence company only. They bought the whole company in Australia and then they put these videos in that and they came out with the so you the with the video, the machine tells you, Acha ye char blasters, this is the one. If you put this one in, you will get a singleton pregnancy with minimal miscarriage rate and high chance of pregnancy. So this is, of course, this machine, the new embryoscope was 1 crore 15 lakh rupees. So it, it's equal to one IVF lab. You can also do it by my friend. So this is Badiola from Mexico. So he, instead of doing all this fancy thing, he did, what we did, he did was he just took one photograph of the blastocyst and he fed it to the machine. And machine by just looking at one photograph can predict the same thing which the other guy has done by looking at the video and this we are using in our lab. So this is how it looks. So we take the photograph and we upload. So we have four blastocysts, we upload the blastocysts and machine in two minutes time sends back the report with the grade. If it is green, we know it's the best embryo to transfer. If it is yellow, we know 50 to 70 percent chance. So by using artificial intelligence, now huge amount of data we have got uh, for that as well. So the other thing is gene editing. Gene editing is, there's a technique called CRISPR, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic report uh, repeats. And this technique, by this technique, what you can do is you can actually go and edit the embryo. Suppose, suppose there's a thalassemia embryo, thalassemia major embryo. You can actually go in and edit it. Only problem is that there is what is known as off-targeting. There are a lot of DNA sequences which are similar to the thalassemia sequence. And instead of editing that one sequence, it may edit others also. So now there are other technologies that are coming in like base editing, etc. And this is how the CRISPR is, but I don't want to. Again, we are planning to do a research project with the one of the biggest. I, you know, so I wanted to learn CRISPR. So I told the, the people in the who are manufacturing the CRISPR machine that I want to go to Germany to learn CRISPR technique. So they said, what are you saying, sir? Our big CRISPR ka lab is in Delhi. Mein. It is called IGIB. So I went for the training. So they were not willing to take me. They said, you are very senior. Ho, aap. <laughs> so they were all juniors. So I said, I fought with them and I went for the training. I was the only senior man there. All were young molecular biologists, 28, 27 year old PhDs. But it's a fabulous you know, 
uh, lab they have got the whole the, mr modi is very interested in the crispr technique because in our country sickle cell anemia is very prevalent and he wants to use the crispr technique to correct the sickle cell in adults not in at present we can diagnose the embryo is abnormal and but those who are already born with sickle you can take the stem cells out and you can use crispr modify the sickle cell gene and reinject those inside so there's a lot of research work going on in crispr in in delhi so the last thing i wanted to tell you was about the endometrium so in this is just the dufastan is there the people and the the there is a lot of uh, now research going on on oral didogestion so in, we need to have luteal support because you can see here that there is a luteal phase deficiency in art and obviously we give them luteal support for all the art cycles be it a agonist cycle or an antagonist cycle and there are a lot of treatment options available like hcg progesterone uh, gnrh agonist on day 6 after transfer estrogen and uh, normally progesterone is used routinely but now instead of using micronized progesterone you can use oral didogestron quite effectively there are lot of studies that have come in there is a lotus one study comparing micronized progesterron with uh, oral progesterron which has given very good results you can see that all the objectives of safety outcomes all are as good as micronized and there is another lotus two study which has compared the oral didogestron with micron uh, gel progesterone gel and has gone shown the same safety and out, uh, good outcomes of pregnancy so luteal support by didogestron because it's a uh, it's a advantage you know people don't like so what i have told my group is that we are still not sure of the first 14 days so a lot of european groups what they are doing after the pregnancy test is positive they stop luteal support they say there is no point in giving luteal support after beta hcg is positive but in india and many of the people worldwide we give luteal support till 9 weeks or 12 weeks because we don't want to stop suddenly because we we are scared that there may be bleeding miscarriage etc by chemical pregnancy so the problem with didogestron at present is that you cannot measure the level in the blood so if if you use a micronized progesterron or a injectable progesterron you have a progesterone level so there are a lot of studies that have shown now that a progesterone level more than 9.5 but definitely a progesterone level of more than 15 is very good it will if you have a post transfer so what i do day 2 day 4 day 8 i do the progesterone level and to see if the level is more than 15 my cutoff is 15 if it is less i will add or i will alternate or give intramuscular but if i use didogestron i don't have a parameter to analyze the level so in the first 14 days what i have decided i will not use it after 14 days when the pregnancy test is positive then i can switch over because the first 14 days are very crucial for me to titrate the dose of the progesterone because if the dose is not good there can be miscarriages later on so uh, this is how i have decided to use didogestron combining combining it with microline thin again thin endometrium is a big issue you can do everything hysteroscopy gcs a prp but you can also do uterine transplant or surrogacy because fortunately yesterday the surrogacy bill has uh, they have made a modification in the rules and there is now some compensation that can be given to the surrogate that's on the new just now the yesterday so maybe because i was telling everyone that if the surrogacy rules become difficult we'll have to go towards transplant because in india lot of patients have damaged uteruses due to tuberculosis how do are you going to give them your children adoption is also a big problem because there's a lot of waiting list again i told you bone marrow cells i am worried about the malignancy part the mutation of the cells so i am not going to use bone marrow too much in my practice prp is okay because prp you inject and then it attracts the stem cells to the site in bone marrow you are directly injecting something into the site the the advantage of the uterine transplant is not so much in the fresh transplant but in the cadaveric transplant and tomaso falcone who is my very good friend who is the boss of the cleveland clinic superb surgeon there and i'm trying to get him to india so he does fantastic cadaveric transplant and you know he was telling me rishikesh the problem is that 
I get to get the uterus out at two o'clock in the night because as soon as the patient is brain dead, first the heart transplant surgeon comes, takes the heart out, then the lung transplant surgeon comes, takes the lungs out, and at the end, then the bowel is taken out, and at the end, we are called to take the uterus out at two o'clock in the night. So, but that's a, because the advantage is because the anastomosis is done directly with the iliac artery. In the normal uterine, punta maker will dissect and all that. Uterine is very small bore diameter. Here you take the uterine, you take the external iliac and use it for anastomosis. So it becomes very easy to do a transplant. Of course, you can do bioconstruction. You can do a bioconstruction of artificial ovary, artificial uterus, and maybe 30 years down the line, we'll be able to have a mechanical womb totally outside our, you know, 3D printing of placenta, blah, blah, all that. And you will be able to, Dr. Chaitanya will be called, Sir, Atta, ready, dhale. He, Dr. Chaitanya will go and open the lid and baby will come out. So this is the last uh, slide of Dr. Nandita, Rishma, me with Bob Edwards, when we were very chotu, we were in awe. And actually the man who is bigger than Bob Edwards is next to him, that is Dr. Yuri Verlinsky, who has done the biggest number of genetic tests in the world. I had gone to his clinic in Chicago in 1998, he died. That's where I learned my PGD in 1998. Verlinsky's Institute in Chicago is the biggest genetic institute in the world. Thank you very much. Subscribe to Nation Next YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get regular updates from Nation Next. Also like Nation Next Facebook page and follow us on Instagram and Twitter.